I uh, think that this morning's talk about Spring Hill School will give you all a little break from wherever you happen to be uh, quarantining or watching or listening from right now. Um, I'm Linda Hawking. I'm the archivist at the Litchfield Historical Society. And I would say that Spring Hill School and its story is probably one of my favorite stories from our archive. Um, and I think that in our current situation with many of us trying to work full time and caring for children and others in our households makes us really long for idyllic institutions like this one all the more. From the WPA Guide to Connecticut, the Constitution State, quote, on the corner of North and Prospect Streets is a covered well and a large elm tree marking the site of the Reverend Lyman Beecher Homestead, which has been moved to Norfolk Road, where it is the main building of Spring Hill School, a co-educational institution for younger children. In this building, erected in 1775 and now drastically remodeled, were born the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher and his sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The Reverend Lyman Beecher, their father, came to Litchfield in 1810 as the pastor of the Congregational Church, serving the parish for 16 years. The Spring Hill School was founded in 1926 in Litchfield, Connecticut by Dorothy Bull and Mabel Foster Spinney, who served as co-principals and teachers. Both women had previously worked in New York settlement houses, and both were active in educational and progressive causes. Mabel Foster Spinney was born in Burlington, Vermont, the daughter of David Johnson Foster and Mabel Allen Foster. Her father was a lawyer, diplomat, and congressman. She received an A.B. from Bryn Mawr in 1907. That same year, her campus was visited by Maud Wood Park, who founded the National College Equal Suffrage League. Bryn Mawr's alumni guide lists Spinney as a teacher at Wickham Rise in Washington, Connecticut from 1907 to 08. An advertisement for the school notes that its course of study prepares students for the entrance exams at Bryn Mawr. The same publication notes that by 1908, Spinney had taken a position as secretary to the, committee, to the Committee on Expenditures in the Department of Commerce and Labor, House of Representatives, Washington, DC, which incidentally her father was the chairman of. During those years, she also worked as a private tutor. In 1910, Spinney became a teacher of French in the Central High School in Washington, DC, where she remained for a year. Perhaps Park's lecture at Bryn Mawr made an impression on Spinney. While she worked to advance her career, she also worked to advance her rights. Together with her father and the wife of a member of British Parliament, Spinney attempted to gain an audience with President Taft, only to be thwarted by the Secret Service. Taft was apparently not as accommodating as President Roosevelt had been. The program of the 42nd Annual Convention of the National American Women Suffrage Association lists Mabel Foster as the president of the DC branch of the National College Equal Suffrage League, as do several 1909 and 1910 articles in the Washington Post. From DC, Mabel headed to New York, where she was a settlement worker and a resident of Greenwich House from 1911 to 1919. Greenwich House, was a cooperative social work settlement intended to improve the living conditions of immigrants in Greenwich Village, New York. It was primarily a social services agency that was committed to the arts. It is there that she is said to have met William Spinney, whom she would marry in 1913. Spinney was an employee of the publishing company Henry Holt and later the Guaranteed Trust Company of New York. In Margaret Sanger's 1917 book, The Case for Birth Control, Spinney is on a list of, quote, well-known women who endorse birth control. Sanger also mentioned Spinney in her 1931 book, My Fight for Birth Control. While Sanger was in jail in 1917, William and Mabel Spinney provided books for the instruction of female inmates. Mabel Spinney also served on the board of directors of the New York Women Publishing Company and was a member of the conference committee of the First American Birth Control Conference in New York in 1921. William Spinney died in 1924. Prior to 1926, Mabel Spinney taught in the Litchfield High School and was acting president of the Litchfield Players. 
Dorothy Ball was born in New York City, the daughter of Dr. Charles Stedman Ball and Mary Eunice Kingsbury of Waterbury, Connecticut. She was educated in a small private school in Morristown, New Jersey, and the Brearley School of New York. After graduation in 1906, Bull pursued social work and had a club of girls at Hartley House, a settlement house on New York's west side that sought social reform through education and charity. Around 1912, she was active in an exhibition to show the bad effects of overcrowding in cities. Bull was seriously ill in 1917 and 1918 and moved permanently to Litchfield, Connecticut, where she had been a summer resident since 1908. In Litchfield, she was instrumental in the formation of the Girl Scouts in 1918, taught dramatics as a volunteer teacher at the high school, was the secretary and a trustee of the Connecticut Junior Republic Association from 1922 to 1926, and was an active member of the Connecticut Society of Colonial Dames. In 1923, Bo, sorry, excuse me, um, she and her brothers purchased the Glebe, also known as the Corner House, from the estate of Edith Howell Perkins Rockhill. In 1926, Bull and Spinney organized the Spring Hill School, acting as co-principals. Bull purchased the former Spring Hill Sanitarium from Dr. John Buell in 1926 to serve as the school's home. The property was located on an estate of 60 acres and included six cottages and the house in which Henry Ward Beecher once lived. The school was incorporated in 1930 and Bull was elected president and trustee. The two women had a progressive education model in mind with the opening of their school in Litchfield, which was to be a boarding school for boys and girls from ages four to 14. An early brochure states, quote, the old fashioned school was interested in instilling information and preparing the child for the future. The new education believes in the validity of childhood as an integral part of life and not merely as a doorstep to the adult years. They go on to note that, quote, for the convenience of the boys and girls live in separate houses, but they work, eat, and play together just as brothers and sisters do in a large family. There is real work to be done and to keep the household going, and the children share in this according to age and ability. We believe that in this atmosphere of individual responsibility and group cooperation, there will inevitably develop qualities of trustworthiness and self-reliance, of open-mindedness and goodwill. Both during their time at the school and after, the pupils of Spring Hill had a lot to say about their education. In student newspapers, brochures, student magazines, letters home, and later reminiscences, both the educators who worked there and the students who attended paint a picture of a magical place where learning happened almost by accident. I will use their words to tell you about the type of education they received. Dorinda Dobbins Putnam recalled, quote, so many memories, the pageants involving a stage each with ponies, a covered wagon, Johnny Appleseed scattering his ski seeds, and the magnificent Roman dinner where we lay down and were entertained by musicians and served great meals by our classmates dressed in togas. Janet Thompson Keep wrote to her family in March, quote, we are starting to tap the trees for sap for maple syrup. The same year, the Spring Hill reporter says, quote, all this week, shining pails have been hanging on the maple trees. An uneven drip, drip comes to your ears. It is sap dropping in the pail. A cloud of smoke is rising from the sap house. When you arrive, you are greeted with a nose and mouthful of steam from a huge pan of boiling sap. There has to be someone watching it all. The time to keep the fire going in a great brick fireplace, which uses up plenty of fuel. Because syrup time comes only once a year, the children are allowed to miss rest hour and are given extra time to work on the sap boiling, so everyone looks forward to maple syrup time. Keep and others had fond memories of the ponies. In another letter home, she wrote, quote, I don't believe I've ever had more fun anywhere. We have glorious fun riding the ponies. Also the pony cart. We certainly get jolted up and down. B, who drove it, and Peggy Squibb and I had such fun when Jenny started cantering over the rocks and bumps as the pony cart was so rickety. Richard R. Anderson recalled, pony riding was one of my best memories, and Raleigh was my favorite. I remember one event, I think at the Baker Farm, where I almost fell off, but finished holding on to his mane. 
Peggy Squibb Stevens added the ponies. That was where Spring Hill outdistanced any other school that we know. I suppose there were about 10, and all you had to do was throw a bridle on them and gallop away. They had all the Shetland characteristics, but you didn't have far to fall. Their kicks didn't reach your head. They just sort of hunched up their rear ends, and of course they were not shod. The ponies were essential to our day and took part in fire chases over the hillsides. They were warm and furry all winter. Geography was memorable for Maisie Venzen Murray. She wrote, quote, making a water wheel in the bathtub, making a little house with stairs, clapboard, shingle roofs, creating a small town with boxes, hanging planets from the ceiling, eating a Roman dinner lying down. I remember all of these, but the one that stands out the most was our map of the US. We hitched up a couple of ponies to scoop up the Rocky Mountains, the Sierras, the Appalachians. We dredged the Mississippi River, lined it with cement, painted it blue and poured water down it. Would you believe that I ended up majoring in geography in college and became a cartographer and geography teacher? Nancy Atwood Gordon also had fond recollections of geography. Quote, the geography classes were fun. The whole school was involved in making a map of the United States on the old tennis court on the south side of campus, which was in disrepair. It was Lake Huron. I'd never heard of the Great Lakes until then, so this was hard, interesting work. Billy Osler and Bill Farnsworth were the Grand Canyon, which involved more elaborate digging, but we all learned a lot about the geographical features of the USA. I wonder if the tennis court ever recovered from our administrations or if Lake Huron was converted to a fine green lawn for the Foreman School. Students also spent a great deal of time in the greenhouse. They even built one themselves. The Spring Hill reporter noted, quote, Miss Fletcher's group have done a great deal of work this year, principally because they have two gardening periods a week and are more interested than before. They sent their own flowers to Sally Sherman, who is in the hospital with appendicitis. The greenhouse made a big impression on Bill Hathaway, who wrote, quote, I am sure going to Spring Hill had a lot to do with what turned out to be my lifelong interest in research and education in plant science. Peggy Squibb Stevens remembered Bogey, Eugenia Bogart, was the school nurse and greenhouse keeper. I don't know why I think she was Canadian. She was immortalized in the school song, quote, and school manure with bogey on that dear old Spring Hill farm. Pupils also learned printing and block printing. In addition to the newspaper, they printed a magazine which included poetry, block prints, and stories written by students. They also printed cards. Janet Thompson Keep wrote, quote, we are learning to make block prints. Miss Spinney put on a competition for a block print, which could be used on the school Christmas card. She also told her family, our newspaper, the Spring Hill Reporter, is only 30 cents a term. You ought to subscribe. You can send the money in stamps. I am the present editor and write about one quarter of everything. We are illustrating it with block prints, and it comes out every two weeks with six pages. Sports and recreation were also important at Spring Hill. There are memories of baseball, basketball, football, tennis, and ice skating, to name a few. Peggy Squibb Stevens remembered, quote, sports were pretty important because we were a small school and everyone was needed. There was football my first year, but girls were not allowed on the team as they had been the year before. All our sports were co-ed within the school, but the boys and girls basketball teams made forays that were exciting. Wickham Rise, Greenwich Academy. One fall on the slanting playing field, we could see the dust coming from the dust bowl. A young Aussie Marin even advertised skates for sale in the Spring Hill Reporter. The December 12th, 1931 issue noted the first skating of the year. Unfortunately for the group who went, they arrived home too late for a warm supper. Janet Thompson Keep wrote, yesterday and today we went skating. It was the most fun. I can actually skate now. Kate is teaching me. Yesterday the ice was like a washboard. Today it was very smooth and I can keep up with the others. She also recalled learning soccer. Almost every day in games we play soccer. It is heaps of fun. About once a year I give the ball a good boot. Timpy plays quite well. Another letter mentions a particular basketball game stating we also had a pajama party on Saturday evening. We played basketball in our underwear. Later, she told her family they were organizing a girls basketball team and that she was to be the forward. 
Her description of the basketball game provided some relief, for they were not playing in their underwear. Quote, we play basketball a lot when we cannot be outdoors. Our costume, green shorts with white stripes on one side, white shirts with short sleeves and round necks, numbers on the back, and Spring Hill on the front. There were some memories that were not documented by photographs, but they are too good not to share, so pardon the lack of visuals. In another letter home from Janet Thompson Keep, she describes the Halloween celebration. Quote, on Saturday, October 29th, we had the annual Halloween party. Miss Bull was in charge. Choosing costumes came first. David Anderson got the prize for the funniest costume. And Lindsay for the spookiest. She was the haunted house. And Charity Wilson for the prettiest girl. The prettiest boy was David Dobbins, as he was Little Red Riding Hood. Michael Clark tells of the Mischief Club's antics. He said, quote, the annals of the Mischief Club may be a bit obscure, but one thing is certain. We invented a hydrogen gun with the help of a chemistry set we found we could produce hydrogen gas, sulfuric acid on zinc, if memory serves, by inserting an improvised spark plug, a cork with two wires to it, into a Pyrex test tube filled with hydrogen gas. We already had the missile and the delivery vehicle. All that was needed with the, was the spark. To get it, we used a radio battery and a coil taken from behind the dashboard of a Model T Ford. The device worked splendidly. When the spark occurred, the hydrogen exploded, propelling the cork into space with great velocity. Our hydrogen gun was, however, hard to aim, even with the use of a stand and a clamp. Perhaps with time, we could have perfected it. Unfortunately, this experiment in progressive education wouldn't last. Dorothy Bull died in 1934, and for a time, Spinney carried on with the school. Bull's obituary in the Litchfield Inquirer stated, Miss Dorothy Bull's place in this community will never be filled. It was hers, and with her it is gone, to remain only as an increasingly poignant memory. We, who never until now even so much as wondered how she did so much, will find things hard, will more and more miss that deft and understanding touch that smoothed things out and made them go. She never in all her life crowded anyone out of anything or anywhere. She was always making room for just one more. She herself never filled a vacancy left by someone else. She found the right person to fill it. Her place is not vacant, it has been fulfilled. Without her, it no longer exists. And this farewell is a loving tribute to a fine and gentle spirit who ever claiming nothing accomplished all things. Numerous memorials testify to how much her loss was felt. Local author and formal Former teacher, Dorothy Childs Hogner, who memorialized the school in her book, Our American Horse, stated, In speaking on behalf of the teachers who have worked at Spring Hill, I am expressing the feelings that all of us have. That to work under Dorothy Ball was to work with a friend. For what is Spring Hill, if not a composite of Dorothy the woman, Dorothy the educator and the idealist, and Dorothy the friend of us all? This school is the image of a great idealism, which even a casual acquaintance saw in her character. She was vitally a part of her school, always ready to jump in and have fun, go on picnics, sleigh rides, play soccer or other games with the children and teachers. As yearly financial deficits began to accumulate, a decision was made to close the school in 1935. That same year, the estate of Dorothy Bull sold the property to the Foreman School of Litchfield. Spinney moved to Vermont in 1940, where she was associated with the Putney School. She died August 25, 1951. The Litchfield Inquirer printed a tribute to her which said, quote, We remember with pleasure the welcome extended to us at Spring Hill by Dorothy Bull and Mabel Spinney during those happy years. It was fascinating to see the great raised and colored maps which the children made, the weaving, the painting, the singing, the little house and pony barn they built with their own hands. The ponies ridden so fearlessly at such an early age were part and parcel of the place. There were often distinguished speakers at the school and friends and parents were invited. Few people who have seen Christmas plays will ever forget them. We remember the caroling before Christmas, the many ways the school touched our lives and helped our children. It is a precious part of the past that lives in our children and for which we will always be grateful. The following tribute to Mrs. Spinney was written a few days before the last graduation by a parent who had been in close association with the school for 10 years. Quote, through her great personal grief at Miss Bull's death, through illness and anxiety, through tormenting financial worries during the depression, 
Mrs. Spinney has continued to give those associated with Spring Hill devotion, understanding, and enthusiasm. She gave of her substance and her strength. She has been brave and generous. Among the alumni of Spring Hill School is folk singer, songwriter, and activist Pete Seeger. His classmate, Addie Thompson Green, remembered, quote, as famous as Pete Seeger became, my famous memory of him is of his fine Tarzan-like ability to climb and swing in the large beech tree near Main House. I'll leave you with Seeger's reminiscence. He said, quote, I'm supposed to send a memory of Spring Hill, where we had small classes and learned to have fun learning, writing plays to perform in, exploring on hikes and other trips, printing on an old press, doing things that big schools can't offer to let children do. Hooray for small schools. Hooray for Spring Hill. P.S. Something good that has happened can never be made to unhappen. I just wanted to offer um, a few tidbits not related to Spring Hill, and then I'll um, check out of the slides and see if anyone has any questions. Um, today and tomorrow, we're participating in an event called Give Local, where um, we are appreciating any donations that anyone would like to make um, to support our, our programs and collections and all of the work we do at the Historical Society. And there's a link on the slide and on all of our social media pages. Um, and then tomorrow at 7 p.m., Kate's starting a new program called Cursive with Kate for Adults. So if you never had the opportunity to learn cursive in school or if you just want to improve your skills, um, you want to write a really nice letter to someone who's stuck at home, um, why don't you join in with Kate tomorrow? Um, just send an email to registration at litchfieldhistoricalsociety.org um, and then you can join in there. So 